Praise God. Are you thankful for the privilege you have to worship the Lord? Amen. I hope so. Like I said, I hope we never take these things for granted. I tell you, this is a, it's amazing. I've read, a, I've read several books, and there's a book out there called Torture for Christ. I don't know if you ever heard it. It's by Richard Lundgren. But they had no access to the Word of God. No access whatsoever. They, if they received a, half a page of the Word of God, they would read it all the time. They would just read it over and over just to get the Word of God inside their hearts. And I wonder sometimes, you know, how hungry we would be for this if there wasn't one on, if we didn't have five or ten in our house. Or there, we couldn't just go to the bookstore and just grab a Bible. How hungry would we be for this? I hope that we'd be extremely hungry, and I hope that that isn't what it's going to take to make us hungry for the Word. Amen? I hope we, we hunger after this. I hope this is a, a, daily, a daily meal that we partake of. Amen? Because we need to partake of this daily. This is not a once a week. New, I mean, you're, you're, you're suffering from malnutrition if you only get this once a week. Okay? If Jesus is only meeting with you once a week, you're, you're in a bad place. I mean, you're anemic. You're probably dying, really. Right? I mean, you're like anorexic right now, spiritually. So we don't, we don't want to forget that. We always want to remember how wonderful the Word of God is. Today, we, like I said before, we have lots of things that are going on this weekend. Memorial Day, military for laying down their lives in battle. We're so thankful for that. I want to mention that again. But aren't you glad God has blessed us with such a powerful thing, such as a memory? Isn't that awesome? I mean, we can remember things. I don't know if you ever think about that. Wow. I have the ability to remember. Who, who is the intelligent designer that made me have the ability to remember? I know so, so, so often I know that sometimes we just think, oh, well, yeah, sure, I remember that. What's the big deal? Well, there is a big deal. God put that inside your mind so you can remember those who have gone before you. To me, that's amazing. I'm thankful that I have that ability to remember. There are things that I don't want to remember, but I'm thankful for the things that God has given to me the ability to remember. I actually looked up the origin of Memorial Day. You know, a lot of times we want to celebrate everything, but it's actually the ones who have fallen on the battlefield. That's what Memorial Day is all about. And so, we're thankful for them today. <clears throat> Don't forget to thank, to thank God for the people that have died for each and every one of us. And then today is also, we want to remember one of the most important days in our heritage as Pentecostal believers. Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Passover, is today, right? It's one of the most important days, was it not? Today, well, it, today is Pentecost Sunday as we celebrate. We remember the very first, well, it wasn't the very first Pentecost, but it was the very first Sunday where, or Saturday, where the Holy Spirit came down and empowered believers to be witnesses all over the world. I don't know about you, but that, that excites me because I remember when the Holy Spirit empowered me to be a witness. And I'm so excited that He did because it gives me a boldness that I could not, I did not have on my own. It gives me a boldness that, that causes me to speak even when there's timidity trying to set in. But the Spirit of God overcomes that timidity, overcomes that fear, and I'm able to speak forth the Word of God. I hope if you have not received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues to be, empower you to be a witness, Jesus thought it was this important. He said, don't go out and start witnessing for me. Don't go out and do anything. Go wait for the power from on high. Right? He said, this is that important. The Holy Spirit is that important in your life to be a witness that you need to wait for Him to come and empower you before you go out and start thinking that you can take over the world without Him. Amen? So we remember the day of Pentecost as Pentecostal believers. I think I had said this a few a couple of years ago, but if you didn't know, we are Pentecostals. Okay? 
We are Pentecostals. And we want to live as Pentecostals, as spirit-filled believers that walk and share the good news of Jesus Christ because He has empowered us to do so. And as we're remembering, we also want to remember, and I know many people don't want to remember this, but today we also want to remember the what was I thinking moments and how thankful we are to have the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. Right? Okay, I know many of those moments we want to forget. We want to put them as far from our minds as we possibly can because I don't want to think about what was I thinking because those moments are not good. And... But I'm thankful for those moments because if we remember them, we can learn from them. Right? If you're not learning from your mistakes, am I on? I didn't think so. I'm on? Okay. All right. If you're not learning from your mistakes, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to keep facing those mistakes over and over again. Right? And so we don't want to do that. I want to share just a few things of few stories here about some what was I thinking moments. It says, I followed my boyfriend at the time to Los Angeles, even though I knew he wasn't in love with me. He was just trying to be nice. I guess, and I said I would come. Three weeks later, we broke up and I was stranded in L.A. What was I thinking? All right? I co-signed a long loan for my ex when we had only been dating for six months. Huge mistake. What was I thinking, right? Sometimes I look back and think about how much of a terrible person I was to my parents when I was a teenager. I know all teenagers are bucket heads and say stupid stuff. But now that my parents are gone, I look back at those times and just wish I would have been nicer. What was I thinking, right? You know, so, so many times we take our relationships for granted, don't we? Oh, well, you know. And we, 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 waste, we waste our lives and then we take the time at their funeral to be nice to them. You know, isn't it funny how I never hear hardly a harsh word at anybody's funeral. <laughs> but, but whenever they're alive, <laughs> you know, you just don't hear the nice things. Isn't that amazing? So... We need to take advantage of the times that we have now to remember people and remember them. Wouldn't it be awesome? I, I would love to do this sometime, just to have a memorial service for each person in the church before they die. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? So the person could actually sit there and listen and see how the people appreciated them. Wouldn't that be awesome? I was struck by this whenever I, we did, I went down and we, I did uh, Crystal's aunt's funeral. I can just imagine, I mean, we had probably 15 to 20 people stand up and share a memory. But did she know that? Did she know any of those things? How much they appreciated what she did? I don't know. She's dead. She's gone. And that's when we choose to express our gratitude, choose to express our love for people. We, we, can't, we shouldn't wait, should we? Because I don't want us to have these regrets of saying, what was I thinking? I know I should have loved on them more. I should have spoken what, you know, like with her aunt, she, she just died. No, nope, It was a surprise for everybody. So nobody got that last moment to say what they wanted to say. Then you have those regrets. Well, if I, if I would have had one more chance, I would have said this. We don't know if we're going to have that one more chance, do we? So don't have that what was I thinking moment. Don't have that regret in your heart. Make the choice today to tell people that you love them and that you are glad that they're in your life. <clears throat> now today I want to look at another person who also made decisions because of thoughts that were not accurate or thought through. Okay? Sometimes there's thoughts that are not accurate with the Word of God and then there's thoughts that are not thought through. Right? Okay? Thoughts are not thought through are usually not good thoughts. Right? We, we make decisions on a whim, and then we look back and we're like, wow, I sh probably should have made a better decision there. So, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 25. 
Genesis chapter 25. If you don't, the word will be up here on the screen. We're going to talk today about someone who made a decision, who made a choice, who thought some things that really weren't true. Starting at verse 27, it says, As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebecca loved Jacob. I don't know about you. Are they supposed to love both their kids? But, okay. One day, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. I say that every day I get home. <laughs> I'm starving, said Esau. What, is, what good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, therefore, thereby selling his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew, and Esau ate the meal then got up and left. He showed content for his rights as the firstborn. Now, I don't know which one is more. I don't know which one disturbs me more. That Esau gave up his birthright for a bowl of stew. Or that Jacob was ready to ask Esau for his birthright for a bowl of stew. You know, I mean, it's like, hmm, this is, this is pretty sad, isn't it? But here comes Esau. Just came in from the wilderness. I mean, he probably hadn't eaten all day. And here he is. He says, I'm starving. Okay, all of us have been there. Right? We've all been there. We haven't eaten all day. We come in. Like, I'm starving. I haven't eaten anything all day. Okay? I just want us all to understand Jesus didn't eat for 40 days. Okay? He wasn't starving. Okay? <laughs> we are not starving after not eating for one day until we get to dinner. But he came in, and so his thought was, I'm starving. Okay, I'm going to die if I don't eat something. Was that true? No, it wasn't true. So, what was he doing? He was adding, he was just adding things to, he was like, he was trying to make a declaration that was false. And so here's Esau, because he's made a declaration that is false, he now believes this. Isn't that amazing? I just thought that I was starving, now I said it out of my mouth, and now I believe it. Hmm. Now, because I've said it, because I've thought it, because I've, I've said it, and now because I believe it, I'm going to give up anything in order to not be starving anymore. Isn't that something? And so Jacob sees how, star how his brother is starving so much, he says, okay, I'll give you a bowl of stew. But first, you must give me your birthright. And here's Esau's response. I'm telling you, Esau is he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Let me just say that. Right? Okay, he says, oh, look, I'm dying of starvation. What good is my birthright to me now? If I die right here because I don't have any food, because I'm dying of starvation, what good will my birthright be to me? And so what does he do? He takes the bowl of stew. And it, you know, maybe lentils were... A, a delicacy back then, but I'm telling you, I'm not giving up my birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. All right? <laughs> I mean, that just doesn't sound that great to me. It doesn't even sound like there was any meat in this stew. Jacob wasn't a hunter. Okay? Hey, there was no meat in this stew. <clears throat> no, thank you. So what was Esau thinking? Well, we see Esau was thinking he was going to die. Esau was wrong, wasn't he? But he gave up something that would bless his future to get momentary satisfaction. 
Nobody here has ever done that, right? <laughs> Nobody's ever given up or made a decision based on their moment, momentary satisfaction and then paid for it later. No, not a single person. So, this I want you to understand what Esau gave up. In ancient times, birthright was a very important and sacred thing. It belonged to the firstborn. The family name and titles were, were to pass along to the eldest son. He became the head of the family. He would also receive a double portion of the inheritance. But it was more than just a title to the physical assets of the family. It was also a spiritual position. And in the case of the people of God, God would lead the family through patriarchs or fathers. Additionally, in the special case of Esau and Jacob, that meant the one to whom belonged the birthright was the one through who the covenant promise made to their grandfather Abraham would come. Ultimately, the Messiah would come through the holder of the birthright and blesses the nations of the earth. Esau was the firstborn, the birthright was his, but like many, he failed to appreciate its value and sacredness. Right? He failed to appreciate what he had. He didn't look at it as valuable. I mean, maybe, maybe if God would came to him or his dad would came, hey, hey Esau, I want you to understand that because of your birthright, the Savior of the world's going to come through you one day. What? Wow. He just didn't understand the magazine. Right? He didn't, he didn't take it for what it was. But so often, just like Esau, we're, we're so willing to forfeit eternal things to gain temporal things, aren't we? He gave up the firstborn blessing as well, didn't he? Because he gave up his birthright, who got the blessing? Jacob. He got the blessing. Now, I want you to understand, I want to kind of put this in today's terms for you. A pot of stew, if you were willing to exchange a pot of stew for your birthright back then, it's kind of like exchanging your wedding ring for a hamburger today. Okay, because you're starving. I don't care. Take my wedding ring. Take it. Take the covenant that I made with my spouse. I'm starving. I need that hamburger. That's pretty serious stuff, right? That's what, that's what Esau was giving up. Just so he could have a bowl of stew. Just so he could have a bowl of stew. But you know, I know, I know we want to be hard on Esau. But can I just say that many of us have given up something of that magnitude for something very ridiculous. We must, we must understand that. We must search ourselves today and realize that are we seeing how valuable the things are that God has given us? You see, what this tells us is, God, is Esau's attitude towards the things of God, his purpose and his will. It shows a lack of reverence and respect. It shows the same, same thing we see in too many people today when it comes to how little regard they have for the Lord. Kind of like this word right here. How much do I appreciate it? How much would you appreciate it if it wasn't there anymore? Right? Like this church, how much do you appreciate it? This building, how much do you appreciate it? The people, how much do you appreciate them? How much would you appreciate it if it was gone? Well, I can just hear the memorial service now. Oh, the church is dead. Oh, I love this church. Oh, I love being able to come there on Sundays and just worship the Lord. But the church is dead. Oh, this church meant so much to me. Right? You know, all those things we want to say that we don't say. But once the church is dead, we'll say it. Right? Does this matter to you? So often telling you we take so much for granted in this world.
Now, I know many may be thinking, wow, you know, is, is what Esau did really that bad? Well, here's what God had to say about it in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, make sure that no one is immoral and godless like Esau. Did you hear that? Make sure no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. All of a sudden, after he didn't get, see, he didn't care about the birthright, but he wanted the blessing. Isn't that funny how that works? We, sometimes we don't want to put in the work. We don't want to have to let God be the Lord and ruler of our lives. But I still want eternal life. God, can I please have eternal life without all the prerequisites? Without having to accept Jesus. Without having to live for Jesus. Without having to do the things that you're asking me to do. But what have we forfeited in our lives because we want something right now? You see, wrong thinking tells us to get all we can no matter, no matter the cost. Get all we can now no matter the cost. I remember working in the grocery business. When I was, about, when I was 16, I started working in the grocery business. and I remember people coming in and stealing a pack of cigarettes. A pack of cigarettes. You know how much they had to pay for that pack of cigarettes when we caught them? A whole lot of money. All they did, they just wanted that pack of cigarettes, right? They thought they were like, okay, I need this immediate satisfaction right now. I need a smoke so badly that I'm going to steal it. They paid hundreds of dollars for that pack of cigarettes. They had now have felony charges pressed against them because of that pack of cigarettes. Was it worth it? To steal a pack of cigarettes. No, it wasn't worth it. But because they wanted that, they needed that right then, right now, they took it. How many of you know that one night of drinking and driving results in higher insurance, possible loss of your license, possibly killing somebody else? We have a friend, uh, we have a couple that are pastors in Georgia. That lost their daughter because of a drunk driver. That drunk driver lived. How do you think he feels today? Knowing that he killed a little girl. All just because they want to have fun right now. You know, sometimes, I know that sometimes we think, well, I just, you know, I just, that's what I felt like doing at the time. I get it. I felt like doing a lot of bad stuff when I was younger. I felt, sometimes I still feel like doing bad stuff, but I have to reject that feeling. You see, one night, if we, if we really look at it the way that we need to look at it, sin can result in death. Can it? Sin can result in death. For example, thief... A thief becomes a thief and takes the lifestyle when he chooses to steal the first time. Right. right? He chose to steal that one time, he got away with it, and the rush just went through him. I'm telling you, give you a rush if you get away with it. Right? And because he did it that one time, now it's in him. What about alcohol? All it takes is the first drink. You don't know you're not alcoholic until you take that first drink. Right? <coughs> You take that first drink and then all of a sudden, boom. If you're a smoker, all it took was that first cigarette. You had to start somewhere, didn't you? A drug addict took a drug for the first time. Once the first time. Did you know that it says that 9 out of 10 people that do crystal meth will get addicted after the first time? 9 out of 10 people. What about a crooked public official? He makes the first hidden deal and takes the first bribe. Right? A broken home could have begun in many ways. By going into marriage, having selfish reasons, or failing to be fully committed to one's partner, or simply choosing the wrong mate. 
a failed businessman. He did not fail in one day, but he failed by a string of wrong decisions. You know, all of these things started with a thought. Oh, I see them doing that. They look like they're having a good time. I think I'll do that too. I know that's how it started for me. I thought it looked fun. I came to realize it's not fun. I've always told people that if, if that was such a great life, why am I still here? Why am I preaching the gospel? Why, do, why am I not still out boozing and, and taking drugs and doing all that stuff? This is, this is it. This is the life worth living. But you see, it started with the idea. The world, oh, oh, so, and then we got some people that, some folks that end up in poverty. It starts with the idea that the world owes them a living. Right? The world owes me something. Why? Why does the world owe us anything? And then we um, choose not to get along with an employer or fellow workers. Many other reasons, all willing choices, greed, laziness. <coughs> then we allow bitterness to come in because we have an unforgiving spirit that can ruin a person's life. Why do we, why do we become, and then we mishandle our money. Not saving as a Christian. Failure to tithe and give thanksgiving offerings to the Lord. You see, all these small errors, all these things that we don't think are a big deal. Oh, wow, well, yeah, there, it's no big deal. It's just, it's just one drink. Right? It's just one drink. It's just, it's just one puff. But you see, what, it always starts with one. None of it. I guarantee if you were to ask an alcoholic, hey, did you expect to be an alcoholic after you took your first drink? No. No way. But they were. Did you expect to be a chain smoker after you took that first, first puff on your cigarette? Nope. Did you expect these things? No, you didn't expect them, but they happened. If you go back and ask Esau, Esau, did you expect to lose your blessing when you sold your birthright for a bowl of soup? Well, no. Well, that's exactly what you've done. You forfeited your blessing, Esau. So I know that I know there's times we don't like to think about these types of things. But the fact is that we need to think about these things because they, they are affecting our eternity. And God cares about our eternity. How many can see what I'm holding here? Anybody see that? Let me see if I can put it up on my finger. Everybody see that? Can you see it? Yeah, you're struggling, aren't you? Okay. This is your life in comparison to eternity. This is your life, in, in, just think about it, in this room in comparison to eternity. Pretty amazing, right? Pretty small, isn't it? It's pretty little. It's short. It's short. You know the old song that says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun? Yeah? We've only just begun. Do you even comprehend 10,000 years? I'm 38 years old. And at 10,000 years, I'm only going to just begin, be beginning. And we think that this life... We think that this life is the life that we should be focusing on. I don't agree with that, do you? Small errors produce larger problems, and many small errors compound into large ones, piling up and causing major problems. The fact is, little, hap little happens by chance. Most of the time, we consciously choose our own future by the choices we make. So what kind of choices are you making today? Are you making choices that are going to benefit your eternity? Are you making choices that are going to benefit someone else's eternity? How, what kind of choices are you making? I have to share this this morning. Some of you may have seen it on Facebook, but... Friday night, 
my four-year-old son gave his life to Christ. Very, very awesome. He, uh, I explained to him what it meant. He, uh, he's, he's known. I mean, we, we could tell that he knew what, what salvation was and what Jesus did for him. And so I, I shared with him again. And I said, would you want Jesus to be your Savior? And he said, yes. And so we prayed with him. And after we got done praying, he prayed a prayer. And he said, God, thank you that I have a new heart. Amazing moments. Amazing, amazing moments in our family. All of, now all my kids are saved. They all know Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. I have a wife that loves God. And you know, it's all, it all started when we opened up our Bibles the very first day we were married and chose to do a devotion and say, hey, this is important. And every night after that, we said, hey, this is important. And we chose to plant good seed, seed that would impact our children's eternity because we realize that this life is not forever. And so we made that choice. And because we made that choice, every, every one of my children and my wife is serving the Lord and loves the Lord and loves serving the Lord. But it took a lot, it takes a lot of work. I'm not going to lie to you. There's nights where I'm like, yeah, I don't really feel like doing devotion. Okay, yeah, I'm a pastor. I'll say it. I, there's nights where I say I don't feel like doing this. But you know what I do? I do it anyway. And you know, after I start, something amazing happens. I start feeling like doing it. Isn't that awesome? You know, it's kind of like praying. Well, I don't feel like praying. But after you get in your prayer closet and you're there for about five minutes, you're like, wow, I really feel like praying now. I don't feel like reading my Bible. Then once you start in on a few verses, you're like, wow, I'm glad I picked this up today. Right? And so, what decisions are you making? Jesus gave us some amazing instruction in Matthew chapter 6. He said this, and I don't believe this is just talking about material, money, resources. This is talking about laying up treasure. What kind of treasure are you laying up? said, don't store up treasure here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures up in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. You ever thought about that? Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Have you ever looked and seen what's important to somebody's life? I know what they give most of their money to. Or I know what they invest most of their time in. Right? Because that's where their treasure is. That's where their heart is now. They give most of their time and their money to that. So therefore, that's where their heart is. So what are you doing to lay up treasures? In heaven. Because like I say, guys, this, this, this life, very short. It'll be gone just like that. Did you know, I was thinking about this the other day. Peter said this in, in 2 Peter. He said, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Did you know none of us have reached a day old yet in God's eyes? None of us are a day old in God's eyes. If that doesn't put it in perspective, I don't know what will. But yet, at 10,000 years, we'll all be 10. <laughs> I don't know. You know, that's pretty amazing to me. So my question is, is what is important to you? What matters? What are you pouring into your family? What are you pouring into your friends? What are you doing? What kind of thoughts? Okay, those thoughts. Okay, the thought that I get when I say, well, I don't feel like doing devotion. I have to reject that thought, right? If I say, well, I don't feel like going to church. I need to reject that thought, right? Because this is a place we need to come. 
Why? Because this is a place where believers gather and are encouraged in the Lord. And they hear the word. They worship Jesus together. I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying. Those are all thoughts we have to reject. So we can lay up the bright treasure in, in, in heaven, right? But how many times do we succumb to those thoughts? And you say, yeah, you're right. I don't feel like it. I think I'll just sit here and do nothing. Can I just say we're all going to pay the price for doing nothing? Or we're going to pay the price for doing what we're supposed to be doing? So I ask you today, what are the desires of your heart? I know every single one of us, if I were to ask you today, I'd say, yeah, I, I want my family to serve the Lord. I want my family to do this. I want my family to do that. What are you doing about it? If you're not doing anything, it's just a, it's just a wish upon a star. Right? I want my family to serve God. Well, what am I doing? What am I doing to see that happen? What am I speaking into their lives to make sure that's going to happen? What are you investing in? Esau obviously didn't see as important to see his family know the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. Right? You think, you think Isaac, his dad, had ever told him about the God of his, his father? I guarantee you had. But he, he was like, no, that's not for me. Or if it was for him, he went about it very lackadaisically, right? That bowl of soup was better than what God had given him. Did you hear that? It's better than what God, God gave him that birthright. What has God given you today that you are forfeiting and saying, no, I think I'll take this temporary thing instead? That will be here today and gone tomorrow. So, I guess the question is, is what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What, what thoughts is this stirring up inside of you? <coughs> what thoughts is, is it causing something to stir up inside of you to provoke action in your life? Because if I don't, if if I stand here Sunday after Sunday, and action is never provoked in your lives to live differently for Jesus Christ, then it's really not making a difference, is it? I was talking to somebody this week. I said, you know, if anybody ever heard the old Sir Stephen Curtis Chapman song, "What About the Change? What About the Difference?" What a life that's undergoing the change, right? I got my Jesus bumper sticker. I got my, my T-shirt on, right? But what about the change? What about the change that's happening inside of us? It all starts right here. Then it goes here. And then it goes here. What about the change? Is the Word of God changing you? Or is it just something that you're hearing week after week and continuing to live it however you want? So what are you thinking? Is the Word of God provoking you to action? Is the Spirit of God provoking you to action? I know that, I know that may seem like, seem like a hard question. But I'm telling you, we, we need to be changing. We need to be doing for the Lord. Jesus didn't give us suggestions. Right? Hey, maybe as a believer you should do this. No, he said go into all the world and preach the good news. <coughs> Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? I asked somebody about, you know, how do you feel your responsibility is about making disciples? And they said, well, I don't really feel like I have that responsibility. I feel like that's your responsibility. I said, really? Hmm. My Bible says that it doesn't say pastors go into all the world, does it? 
even though that's my responsibility as a believer. Do you know, in Ephesians chapter 4, this is what it says my responsibility is. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what God's called me to do. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Right? So we're here to be equipped to go out there and work. Isn't that amazing? Has anybody ever thought of that before? I hope nobody has the attitude of, well, that's what we pay the pastor for. Because <laughs> that's a stinking attitude, I'm telling you. That's some stinking thinking right there. I am grateful to work alongside you. Very grateful. But that God has not called us to warm, to warm seats. He's called us to work in His ministry. Amen? Amen? So let's take that calling very serious. Let's take what God has given us very serious. This is, a, this is what God has given us. He's given us a commission. Are we treating it like Esau treated his birthright? This great commission that Jesus gave to us. Had you gave it up. Now, many of us aren't giving it up for a bowl of stew, but we're giving it up because of fear. We're giving it up because we don't want to offend anybody. We're giving it up because we want to be liked. Right? If I say something about Jesus, they may not like me anymore. Do we understand that? We're giving up the commission that Jesus has given us. This is a God-given commission. We're giving it up for just about anything. Stand with me this morning. I want everybody to understand here that I am just as guilty as anybody else in this place. If you feel guilty today for abandoning the commission that Jesus has given us. Why did he give us this commission? Because he cared about eternity. He cared about people making eternity. He cared about us making eternity. What if the disciples did not take this commission seriously? Would we know Jesus today? So, now, it's, now we're looking ahead to people 500 years from now. What if we don't take it seriously? Will people 500 years from now know Jesus? Probably not. I'm thankful for the God-given responsibility that He has placed upon our lives. I'm thankful for that commission that He's given to us. I'm thankful that He cares much more for us than we could ever imagine. So you're here this morning. You're saying, you know what? Maybe I have, I have had the thinking that that's the pastor's job. Or I don't really need to do that. It's not really that important. Can I just tell you how important it is? How important Jesus thought it was? That he came back to life to tell his disciples to do it? That sounds pretty important. Before he left this earth, he said, this is what I need you to do. What about the Holy Spirit? Another gift that God has given us. How do we treat Him? Do we grieve Him? Do we squelch Him? When He's trying to lead us in all truth, do we say, hey, Holy Spirit... I'll take it this time. Many of us are here today. We have to make a choice. Today is the day. We have to make a choice. What choice are you going to make? Are you going to make a choice to let the Holy Spirit empower you Why did Jesus give us this gift? And many people have rejected it. Well, I don't really feel like I need the Holy Spirit. 
if Jesus said that it's good that I go away, because then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. How can we ever say we don't think we need Him? So this morning, I want to take this opportunity. We have lots of time. I want to take this opportunity. If anybody wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this place today, I want you to come and I want you just to stand in a row right here. If you want to be baptized in the Spirit, you want to be baptized in the Spirit, you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want you to come and I want you to stand. This is a gift that God has given us. A gift that God has given us. Just as He gave Esau his birthright, God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter said this on the day of Pentecost. He said, the people came to him and said, Peter, what shall we do? We feel guilty. We feel like we're, we're convicted in our hearts. What should we do? And Peter said this, repent, be baptized, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here Maybe you've done the repentance. Maybe you've done the baptism in water. But now you want to take that next step and you're saying, I need to be baptized by the Spirit of God so that I can be empowered to be a witness. Maybe it's been a while since you've allowed the Holy Spirit to move in your life and you want to renew. You want a refreshing. You want a rejuvenation. Maybe that's you. I want you to come up here and just line up in the front. This is an amazing opportunity. Amazing opportunity. I trust that everybody has the Holy Spirit in their lives. The Holy Spirit has empowered you. It's filled you. It's the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now I want to address the rest of us. Have you been like Esau and allowed the gifts of God to become so ordinary to you that you sold them, that you sold out for your own for your own desires? Have you allowed things to come in and distract you? And you've given up the things that God has given you. If that's you this morning, I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you personally. Because I believe God wants to do a work inside of us. We don't have to, we don't have to walk out of here guilty. We can walk out of here forgiven with a new lease on what God has given us. So come forward. I want to pray for you today. If you, have, if you have taken for granted the things that God has given you in this life, maybe it's the commission that Jesus gave to us. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's the love of God. Maybe it's the grace of God. Maybe it's His mercy. You've taken it for granted. And you're saying, Lord, I don't want to take it for granted anymore. Just come forward. I want to pray for you today. In no way do we want to condemn you. We want to love you. We want to pray for you. We want to see God restore us back to right relationship. What is the Lord stirring in your heart today? Lord, here we are. God, we're a church, Father God. God, we don't we don't do everything right here. God is the pastor, Father God. I take responsibility. 
I take responsibility, Father God, for everything, Lord, that is not done. And to show honor to you, to show honor to the things, Lord God, that you have given to us. The things that you have blessed us with, Lord God. Forgive me, Lord. Father, I, I pray, Father God, for every person in this room, Lord. God, as we are here, Lord God, as we are crying out to you and saying, Lord God, God, forgive us, Lord, for taking for granted the things, God, that you have given to us. The things that we have given up for almost nothing. God, the things that we have sacrificed, Lord God, to really gain momentary satisfaction. God, I pray, Father God, that our hearts, Lord, God, would fall in love with you. God, that our hearts, God, would fall in love with your mission. God, that our hearts would fall in love with, what, with your desires for our lives. And God, that we would step out, God, and we would, Lord, embrace your will, Lord God. God, I know how easy it is, God. It's easy in my life, Lord, just to get caught up in my own thing. And want to do my own thing, God. But Lord, you didn't call me to do my own thing. You called me to serve you. You called me to love you. You called me to love others. So God, today, I pray, God, that we would get back to our roots. And God, that we would be a church that loves you and loves others. That we would be a church that displays that love. That God, you would provoke action inside of us. You would provoke action in us, Lord God, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. God, to make disciples. To love on the lost. To care for the poor. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to be your church. The church you want to come back for. God, I praise you and I thank you, Father, for who you are. I thank you for your word, God, that never changes. Your word that convicts our hearts, God, and causes us to be and do better. Thank you, Lord God. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.